All right, so. <clears throat> oh, sure. Thank you. Perfect. Is that better? All right, so uh, my name's Ron Edwards, and today I'm going to talk about building modules using metaprogramming. So, what do I mean when I say we're going to be talking about building modules with metaprogramming? Uh, actually, I don't, I don't quite know what, what that means, but it sounded like a really good word. But uh, now, metaprogramming, if you look up the definition, uh, I think it's the writing of computer programs that have the ability to treat other programs as their data. Uh, it's also known as uh, <clears throat> programs that write other programs, right? So um, what I'm mostly going to focus on is kind of a, it's a, a method of, of making modules that I started using to improve some old commands that I had where there was a lot of code reuse. Uh, we're going to... To get the concept, you know, we'll, we'll talk conceptually what I'm talking about in just a second, but before we actually get started talking about that, I want to demo what I'm talking about. It is, it's kind of hard to wrap your head around. So we will start with a very quick demo. So if I look, uh, if I get module, I have two modules here called, uh, one called the AdventureWorks Reader and one called the Northwind Reader. And so these modules have, they just have three, three commands. Uh, the first one has one command that's exported get aw demographics. The other one's nw customer and get nw employee. So the Northwind and AdventureWorks databases obviously are just like databases people use when they're learning how to read SQL statements or uh, create SQL statements to read out of the database. But if we take a look at the syntax of, let's look at the aw demographics one. So you can see, you know, we have some parameters here. Uh, looks like first name, last name, uh, and if we take a look at MW customer. So we have different parameters from there. This will be important in just a second. We can take a look at the help on get MW customer, and if you take a look, you know, it actually has a, a synopsis in the description. They don't mean anything to you. This is I, I put it in just to kind of demo that. We're getting help out of these commands, and again, this will make sense in just a minute. Uh, we have these, you know, we have some parameters that have help. There were a lot of parameters. I didn't want to put help on all of them, but you can see company name and contact name have help associated with them. So, if we go to use these, uh, the purpose of these commands is to to generate dynamic SQL statements to read out of the database. So we can do something like for the AW demographics, um, you know, first name starts with an A. Uh, let's just select the first five, I guess. So, you know, we're pulling data out of the AdventureWorks database. I don't know if it's actually, you know, anything that's, uh, that's completely useful, but we can filter on multiple things, you know, things like Education, I think high school is something that you can filter on there. We can come, you know, there's, uh, there, I don't know if you noticed, there was a group by and order by uh, common parameter between the two modules and the uh, functions we were looking at. So we can, you know, you notice we have some uh, IntelliSense here and we can do a group by, uh, let's, let's group by the education and gender, maybe. So you can see that. You know, behind the scenes, it's, it's generating this dynamic SQL. And that's not a big deal. There's a lot of modules that can do this kind of stuff. <coughs> what is, I think, uh, kind of neat is if we look at the way these modules were actually built. So here's the Northwind reader. And you can see that it, it's calling another script. But here's how, it's, how these commands are actually defined. So you know, this first one's about 50 lines, it looks like. So you come in, you can look, that that's where that help we were looking at is coming from. But all this has is a param block. Actually, let's do this. The only thing that this, and, and you notice instead of function, we have this, yeah. uh, this keyword, I guess, I put that in air quotes, uh, called DB reader command. It's a little domain specific language. But we, we get this keyword and we get the function name. And then you'll also see these fake attributes right now they just say magic in front of them so that you know, I can tell that they're fake but that combined with a real param block with help mixed in with those parameters and that's it that param block is enough to build that command that we saw oh and we didn't actually I did not demo 
get MW employee. So if you look here, we actually have a formatting in there. If you take a look at, you know, send that to format list, you'll see more is coming across than what we get by default. So let's go back and look at the get NW employee. You'll see that, you know, mixed in with these fake attributes, you have this format table column. So putting one of those in is enough to tell it that we're gonna want this in a view and we want that, and, and behind the scenes it's generating some uh, formatting PS1 XML files and, and adding all that. So this isn't, you know, I'm, I'm not really so much trying to demonstrate uh, these modules, it's more the concept behind why what we're gonna kinda cover is useful. All right, so, and in a minute I may wanna switch back and uh, So, so you know, why would, I, why would you wanna do that? Hopefully after demoing that a little bit, it starts to kinda become a little bit clear. All right, so, what those commands were doing, uh, let me start with the precursor to this module. Years and years ago, about uh, four years ago, I started making commands to look into the SCCM database at work. You know, SCCM has, has uh, an amazing amount of information, and so I started out, I think the first command I made was like, get SCCM computer, so that I could look at relevant information on a computer. I could search by a name, by an IP address, by a specific model number. I could look for computers that hadn't checked in in a certain amount of time. And so, you know, I spent a lot of time, I, you know, I made a nice param block and, and uh, inside the function, I, I made logic that I could map all that stuff together. I spent a good amount of time and I made what I thought was a very useful command. And then I wanted more information out of there. So I came up with another SQL statement that I thought was very, very useful. I chopped it up, I copied the original command. Uh, generated a new command based off of that. I went in and changed everything that I needed to do. Within 10 minutes, I was able to have another very useful command. Fast forward, you know, 10 months, a year, and I have 20 commands that I've built up. But over time, each one of those commands are a little bit different, and I added more functionality to some of them. As you saw there, you know, we had the ability to do a group by or an order by. So maybe the first command, I didn't think of that, and I didn't think of the ability to do a negation uh, to be able to negate a specific parameter that came in. But 20 commands in, maybe I have added that functionality. And now I have 19 commands that I have to kind of go back and port that functionality into, and not, you know, I don't have time to do that kind of thing. So I had on my to-do list for a very long time a way, you know, I needed to come up with a way to make it that I didn't have to go back and do that. I wanted to make kind of an engine uh, so that I could use the same exact code uh, for each module, or for each function, and have it, uh, you know, by doing that I was able to, if I came across a bug, I could fix it in one place and re-import the module, and, and, I, and all the bugs were fixed. If I wanted to add functionality, I could fix it in one place, and all the commands could come along for the ride. And the only, the only work that's, that's left after you do that is to come up with that you know, the, the command definition that we had, which as you can see there, you know, that was just essentially a param block. You know, that was uh, very, very, very easy. I guess you could call it a domain-specific language. So anyway, it, it takes code reuse kind of to the extreme, you know, and instead of having commands that generate static code that I can then save, I, you know, I can just edit things on the fly and, and uh, import them. So, uh, it's, it's definitely, it's probably really only useful in certain scenarios. Uh, I have a couple of code examples. We're not going to kind of cover how all that works because honestly and truly behind the behind the scenes of that is, is pretty ugly right now. It's, it's really big and, and clunky. But I do have a couple of examples I think are, that could be useful. Uh, they're very, uh, and, and I think they're simple enough that we can, we can kind of go through how to build the first one, so because I'm sure somebody else can kind of take these same techniques and come up with something better than you know than I can. So I think I'm going to be done just trying to talk, and we will let's demo stuff. Hopefully, I feel a little bit more confident about that. So the very first thing we're going to do is we're going to make uh, we're going to make a little module that will allow us to just 
build dynamic commands that don't do much of anything. But you know, I will kind of we will go over how to uh, you know that, that concept of building a reference script block and then having all the other command and, and having that reference script block be smart enough to know to do something different. I mean, obviously, if you make two commands that have the exact same definition, you know, it, how it, it sounds like you know they're going to do the same thing, and so why is that useful? So our first module we're going to make. We're going we're to set this up. Let's see. Can everybody see that? Zoom in a little bit. <coughs> All right. So uh, first thing you're going to see, we're not going to actually create modules that are on disk. Uh, but this is this is going to behave exactly. If you were if you were to write all this stuff that's inside these uh, these braces to a file and then call import module, it does the exact same thing. There's nothing special about this. This is just an in-memory uh, dynamic module. But again, if you were to take this, write it to a file, and call import module on, it's going to do the exact same thing. This is just so I don't have to switch between files. All right. So our first one, you'll see that inside this module, we're going to define our reference command. And this is going to be the thing that we'll go in and tweak as we want to add more functionality. And our this is kind of our hello world uh, example. All this is going to do is call write host, and it's going to say, I'm the whatever the command name is command. Useless function, but the more important part here is how we're going to spin these commands up. So we're going to create a little, like a little miniature domain specific language. We're going to have this function called dyn command. Uh, it will act as a keyword. All right. So you see that it will take a command name in, and it's going to take a, a, a scope right now. This is, uh, this is more to kind of, I'm going to show you one of the pitfalls to, to doing this. At first, when you create this, you're probably not going to want to play with the scope on this. But all Dyn command is going to do is take the command name, and then it's going to take that reference command. It's going to create a, a, a new function. And it's going to use whatever scope you have there. By default, it's going to use the script scope. And that's honestly and truly the one you do want to use. But again, I'm going to show you one of the early pitfalls I came across. And then it's going to call export module member. So this function. Well, let's bring this, let's import this real quick. And we have dynamic module, so we should be able to call, oh, no, I guess we can do that, get command module. At some point IntelliSense will kick in. Yeah, so you can see it has one command that's exported right now. That's called dynamic command. So if we call it and try to create a command called command one, let's do this. So if you take a look, at the exported command, you can see command one is listed, and then you have, uh, we still have, remember, dyn command that was all, also exported. But there is a problem. If we call get command on command one, you'll see that it can't find it. So, if we create a command and put it in the global scope, again, you're not going to want to do this, but and I'll explain what's going on here in just a second. And then take a look at the exported commands. You'll see that this command two isn't listed in the exported commands from this module. But if you call get command, you do see it there, right? Now command one, remember we don't have it here, but if we were to actually call inside that <coughs> dynamic module scope, it is in there. It did truly create a function, but it was in that script scope. So what's happening here, is when the module is imported, uh, and, and when we're calling new module there, it's, essentially, it's the same steps that are occurring. When the module is imported, there's some special logic that it comes through and realizes, you know, hey, I have this list of, of uh, commands that need to be exported. And it's smart enough to realize whether or not it's a nested module and those need to be hidden from global scope, or whether or not it's, it's a, you know, those functions are supposed to truly be exported in the global scope, and it handles that for you. If you try to go in like we did a second ago and do this, you'll see that it wasn't listed as an exported function from the module. And it, it is truly in the global scope. If you had, if you tried to call this as a nested module, it would start, you know, it would come out into the global scope, and you probably don't want that. So the whole point of that exercise there was to show that we probably, you'll probably want to keep that dynamic command keyword inside the module scope and not expose it. And as long as you call it inside the module, you're, you're fine. So, you know, that's why in the, the database examples that I was showing, 
you saw that inside the module I was calling the commands there. It's not if you, this doesn't really work very well for allowing someone to at the command line create something. And to be honest, there's, I don't know that there's much reason to do that. So we'll look at this and this is exactly the same. We have the exact same reference command. The only difference between this module and the previous one is that we call the dying command keyword inside the module. So we'll import this module in. We take a look at what's exported. Uh, instead of command two, I, I created one called uh, another command. But you'll see that those are both exported, so that's good. We can call get command on it. That works. If we actually call these commands, that works too. But again, this doesn't do anything useful. They do technically do something different, but they're not doing anything that is useful. And as a matter of fact, they're, they're still very similar. They, they, have, they have the same command syntax, uh, which is, you know, they, they just take common parameters. Uh, I would show you the, the other command, but it's going to look just like that. There's no point. So the next step on here, and then after this, I promise we will do something that has potential use. The next thing I want to do is show how you can, you can make these, make the reference command script block smart enough to actually present itself as a different command or as a command with different parameters and how you can make it actually do something uh, so that the commands can differentiate themselves. So if you look here, we have our reference command again. And the difference here, so we still have our, we, we write to the screen and say which command we're coming from. We're also going to output the bound parameters. So other than that, the process block is exactly the same. The big difference is, oh, and I did skip over one thing. One thing that's different between this module and the previous one is that we're going to create a hash table that will live just in module scope, and this is going to contain whatever command metadata that we want to, uh, that we want to have. And the reference script block is going to be smart enough to go look into that and figure out how it needs to behave differently. So the easiest way to get the, the, the syntax to be different and to have different parameters is to just use dynamic parameters. It's not the only way that the, those database readers weren't using dynamic parameters. But that's going to be the easiest way to do it. And all this is doing is this is looking into that command info hash table up here. And it's just depending on uh, a dynamic parameter dictionary to already be present and to be returned. So we will make a change. Now we're going to actually change our dynamic command uh, function here. So we'll still take a command name, but we'll also take a script block that's going to be the definition. And all we're going to do is end up invoking this. But we need a way to, when we, when we create the command, we need a way to tell it to add parameters to it. So inside here, we're going to create just another function. Uh, and this way, you know, you can't accidentally call this parameter uh, keyword outside the scope of the the dynamic command. But all the all this thing's going to do is it will take a, a parameter type, a parameter name, and a set of parameter attributes. And then it's going to do what, what you, the work you normally have happen inside a dynamic param block and create a dynamic parameter. And it will it will put it into you know this same command info hash table that was defined above. It's going to add the, the dynamic parameter into the dictionary up there. And then the process block of the dy dynamic command keyword, uh, it's, this is new. So this is where when, you, when it first starts to execute, it's going to create an empty runtime defined parameter dictionary. Then it's going to execute the code inside the script block, which is where the parameters will be defined. All right, so. Now if we have our command one and command two, what we're doing here is telling it we're going to create a new command, we're going to call it command one. And command one is going to have a single parameter, it's going to be a string, and we'll name it parameter one. Dynamic command, then we'll make another dynamic command, we'll call it command two, and it's going to have three parameters. The first one is going to be an integer, it's going to be called ID, uh, it will have two attributes, uh, one 
is a parameter attribute. We're going to make it mandatory and put it inside of a, a parameter set. And the other one yeah. is a validate set. <coughs> then we will have a name parameter that's a string. It's going to be in a different parameter set. And this is just to kind of show that you can, you can give it any attributes you'd like. And then we're going to create just a generic object parameter. It's going to be an object of, you know, it'll take objects and it'll be named object. I'm simple. Oops. So we'll read that in. And if you take a look at the syntax, you will see in just a second that command one and command two do have indeed have different syntaxes. Command one has our first per, you know, just just the, the single parameter along with the other common parameters, but you can feed something to it. And command two has two, and you can see up there where it, it does have two parameter sets, so the syntax is showing correctly. And again, this doesn't do anything. Uh, let's do ID because it had a validate set. So, But that shows that we, we were able to spin up two commands that do completely, or that have different signatures. So let's take that and actually try to apply it to something that could be potentially be of use. So yesterday uh, I saw uh, Jeff's session about building, uh, you know, coming up with code to help you build other commands. And he had a really, really neat one where he took, uh, he had a little GUI that you could create a command based on, you give it a, a sim class and you could go in and pick the different properties that you want and it, it would spin up a command for you that would uh, just be easier to use than get sim instance and with the sim class and telling it all the properties you wanted. So what we're going to do, and this should look very familiar, so it's going to be almost exactly like the previous one, except the reference script block will actually be, well, first let's look at, it might be easier if we take a look at how we're going to define the command. So this will give you an idea of what the, the domain specific language will look like. So we're going to create a keyword. Instead of dying command, we're going to have sim command. And sim command will take a name, and that's going to be the name of the function that we will create. These probably aren't, you know, these aren't very good because it you know, kind of looks like get sim instance and all that. It's, so you would probably want to rename these. But we will allow inside the domain specific language, you can give it uh, zero or more sim parameters. So when you do, when you don't define any sim parameters like down here, it's going to actually use get sim class to figure out what all the parameters are and it'll, it'll allow all that stuff for you or it'll do all that work for you. But if you do, do give it parameters, you know, get, get sim service should only have two parameters that it will allow you to filter on and two properties that come back on the objects that are output. You also tell it which sim class you want. So the first two are going to use Win32 service and the last one is going to use Win32 process. So that's what the domain specific language is going to look like. So we'll very, very briefly talk about what the, you know, implementing the domain specific language again looks very, very similar. We take a, we make a sim command function that's going to act like a keyword. We have a string and a script block. When you look down the process block, you'll see where uh, just like with the previous command, we take, you know, we create a new uh, parameter dictionary and then we invoke the definition. And the only things that are really would be valid inside the definition, well, besides other valid PowerShell commands, but the other only domain specific language constructs that would be valid inside there would be the sim class and the sim parameter keywords. Sim parameter is going to do just like the, the previous, you know, the parameter from last time would do. And sim class is just going to take it, and it'll, it'll optionally take a namespace. But this will, will take that command info and add the sim class and sim namespace information there. So after we've invoked that, that definition, we do a little bit of error checking. You, know, you, you need to make sure that, that a sim class was specified. If not, write an error and the command just won't get generated. If it was, Go ahead and, and you know this is kind of this this has two purposes. We're going to get sim class on and we're going to check against that namespace and that actual class 
We'll make sure it's valid. If it's not, it's going to give us an error. But we'll use this sim class info just in case the user didn't, didn't give any parameters. So if there are no parameters, then we'll go through and call the sim parameter keyword here for each parameter that gets, get sim class is aware of. And then of course we define the function and export the module member. So that leaves explaining what our reference command does. And this is where all the work is going to happen whenever you use this, this method. So now you notice our dynamic param block is still really simple. All that work was done when we built the command. But now, if you look inside the process block, what this is going to do, uh, I'm not going to go line by line through it, but, but essentially what this does, we're going to create a hash table that will be splatted to get sim instance. And we're going to take a look, I forgot to mention, that the reference command now has a parameter that we're defining. It will be on every one of the commands generated from this called computer name. This isn't a very good parameter to use because there probably are some sim classes that have a property called computer name. So you would, oh, so I'm seeing, so maybe, maybe that's not a bad name to use. More likely to be named. What's that? More likely to be named. Okay. So, but that is something to think about. You may want to confirm that it's not going to be, you know, in, in a case where you're allowing, uh, you know, when you're, you allow almost any kind of property, uh, this could cause some kind of a conflict potentially. But this is proof of concept code, so we'll let, it, we'll let it ride. But you can provide a computer name. So every one of these commands that get generated will have that computer name. Think of it as a common parameter. And so we create a hash table and we take a look and, and then at that point we also get the information out of the command info hash table that's living in module scope that should have a reference to every one of the dynamic commands we created. And again, we use the key for that is the current command's name. So we get that sim class, and uh, let's see. Then we go through each one of the parameters, and we know that everybody has a computer name. So if we if the parameter we're looking at is computer name, then we add computer name to those get sim instance parameters. We're going to end up splatting that hash table back to get sim instance. So if there's no computer name specified, it'll just run on the local system. Then we go through every other parameter, and we're going to just build a dynamic WQL statement. And so we have a little bit of logic there that checks to see the type of the parameter, if it's a string. And you know, this this is something you would definitely want to work on more. Uh, it's it's probably it's not going to be very resilient, but it, right now it just looks. If it's a string, then it's going to quote it, and it's going to change the operator to like. And then it'll end up and and this is to build the where clause. So if the, if the user doesn't provide any parameters, then it's just going to call it without any where, where clause. There will be no where conditions. So then down here is where it actually takes, uh, it looks at all of the parameters that are valid for this thing, that are all of the dynamic parameters. And then it ends up just building a select statement and you know from the sim class and uh, it does not apparent, so yeah, I just now realize this. This isn't taking the namespace into account, so yeah, don't do anything outside of root sim, uh, simv2 right now. But then it takes our sim instance param hash table that we defined earlier, it adds this to the query parameter, and then it just splats that to get sim instance. So let's read this in. And see if it works. So if we get module or get command module dynamic module, you can see that we have our three commands. Remember, get sim service the first one. Get command get sim service syntax. The first one only had we told it you know we wanted the state and the name. So that is all that's there. If we call get sim service, you'll see. Now, what's happening here, as a matter of fact, let's actually filter this real quick. So state is running. So you can see that we were able to 
you know, it, it's working and it really is only returning name and state. It's uh, PowerShell's formatting system is kicking in, you know, for a service that if you did a normal get sim service or get sim instance on Win32 service, you know, all of these properties would be the return by default. Uh, we could very easily go back in and, and add these if we wanted to. But the neat thing is, get sim service 2, that was the one that we actually, uh, we told it to just let it put all the valid parameters in there. So, you know, we should be able to come in and do something like where state is, is uh, let's see, stopped. Oop, hold on. Something else you might want to do is uh, transform the parameters as they're put in so that you replace asterisks with uh, the the WQL and SQL wildcard. But you can say where it's stopped and start mode is auto. Yeah, so like, yeah. So, and let's actually take that and run it against localhost. And so, you know, you can see that you can take this, this command that we, we spun up with just a few lines. Of, I mean, behind the scenes, it took a, a decent amount of work, but we were able to with just, you know, what, what was that, three lines of, of code for the actual command definition down here. With that, we were able to have a command generated that, you know, we can, we can do, we can perform filtering, we can perform it against any number of machines that we would like. And there is one more thing I wanted to show before we move on. And that is, if we come back in this reference script block, and this is just a kind of, this is like an idea, maybe you get an idea of you want IntelliSense to be added for some of the properties. So that, that kind of gets back to that idea of you, you make improvements and you, you want to use them so that every command gets to come along for the ride. So when we look somewhere, I define the sim parameter, there it is. So inside the sim parameter, I have this commented out because it's, it's actually pretty inefficient because there's not very many properties that fit on this. But what we're going to do is every parameter that comes through, we're going to add an argument completer attribute on it. And inside the argument attribute, it's, uh, it's, it's a whole bunch of crap. And to be honest, it's, it's only going to work on certain properties. What we end up doing is using get sim class to look up whatever the current class is, and it looks for any properties that have a qualifier of value map, which I think, and it appears to work, it's kind of WMI's way of, of having, uh, telling you what the valid values are. So we just uncommented that, that kind of mimics adding that functionality, and now we can call get sim service, and look at state, and you can see that we now have IntelliSense added to it. So that was get sim service, it's the same way with get sim service two, State. Uh, well, status has it as well, I guess. Uh, let's see, the start mode. Yep, start mode. So you know, you get IntelliSense for it. You know, this this made it essentially for anything that has that value map qualifier. And we never did look at get sim process, but it's there too. So anyway, I, I don't know. Does that look like it could be useful for anything? Yeah. All right. Absolutely. So next I'm going to move on to uh, doing this without uh, a domain specific language. You know, this was an idea I had. I was, I was trying to think of different uses for this. And, you know, I came up with something that, yeah, you know, I, I don't know how useful this would actually be, but you know, a lot of times I've tried to make, create little bitty miniature WPF user interfaces. And, you know, uh, and first of all, there's a module I think that kind of does this stuff, show UI. Uh, I haven't used it uh, myself, and you know, I'm, this almost definitely is not gonna be better than that, so you know, definitely go check that out. Uh, but what I've done, because my interfaces are pretty simple, you know, I'll, I'll use the XAML and, and I'll have it read that in, and then I'll have to go in and find whatever controls I'm looking for and, and attach whatever events I want. And I was wondering if there was any way, you know, you could, use this to build a module that would allow you to make WPF user interfaces. So, we're gonna try that. Now again, this should look pretty similar. 
Uh, in this instance, we're going to have, uh, here's our hash table for command names. This is going to kind of be like the command info before, but we're going to actually just use, let PowerShell use reflection to try to take a look at the different uh, parameters to use for our WPF commands that are generated. So, in this case, we're going to have, let's take a look at the reference script block. This time around, the dynamic frame block isn't quite as simple. And I'll go ahead and spoil this for you. What it's doing is, uh, instead of, you know, in a little bit, I'll show you where it's going to read. It's going to look for every single WPF UI element, which I believe is the base class for all of the visual, you know, the elements in WPF that you would use. It's going to take every one of those and create a new function based off of those. And inside that command name, <coughs> it's just going to store whatever name you used and whatever the type is. Now that makes it so if you want, you could, you know, you can add prefixes to your command names or something like that. Uh, then it's going to come through, and here's where it uses reflection. It takes that type, and it gets a list of all the public properties. And then it ends up taking a look, and if the public property has a, a public setter, then it's going to make that. That's going to be a valid parameter that you can, do, you can use. It also takes a look to see if that, uh, that property has an add method attached. If it doesn't have a public setter, public setter, but it does have an add method, and that add method takes a single uh, argument, then it will allow that to be a parameter as well. And we'll have logic inside the process block that will fix all that. Here's where it actually generates the parameter. And then it does the exact same thing for public events. So, uh, so what we should end up with is, you know, like if we have a WPF window, we'll have a command called window. And we're going to have a whole bunch of parameters. Anything that is uh, a public property or a public event that can be set, we will have that available to us as a parameter. And then here's the actual code that's going to happen when everything's run. It's going to, it will go through each one of the, the properties that you define. It, first it will create uh, an instance of itself. Let's see. That must have been up here or right there. Yeah, so you know, it's aware of what its type is. And so it will actually create an instance of itself, and then it's going to go through each one of those properties. And we already checked to make sure it could have some, you know, it, it could be set, or if it's a collection, it could be added to. So then the big for each block here goes through each one of the properties and does that. And here's the part where it takes that reference script block and associates it with, with each one. So, so let's see, we have take a look at the amount of code this is. So, I don't know, from line 11 to 175, so, you know, a little over 160 lines of code. Take that. And first, let's take a look at how many commands we have. So, with 160 lines of code, we made 181 commands. So, things like, well, let's take a look at button. And this isn't going to be pretty, I'm going to warn you. So, yeah, this isn't something where you're going to use the help system to try to help you take a look. Yeah, I mean, you, you're going to want to go to online help for this. But what's neat about this, if you've ever written anything in XAML from PowerShell without, you know, without help, which is actually not that bad, uh, but, you know, it's, it's – yeah, I'm going to just kind of retype what we have here because I want to show you that, you know, as you're writing, you get uh, – should be IntelliSense title. So you can do all that stuff. So we have something here that, you know, it kind of resembles XAML without all the extra XML stuff on it. Now, you know, what this is saying is we're going to create a window and inside the window, now this is, you know, I don't like this part right now. We have to know that, the you know, the actual property that, that contains the stuff, you know, in XAML you would just have a window opening tag, a window closing tag, and in the middle you would put the stuff you want. Right now we're having to say content, uh, then we create a stack panel, and for stack panel, instead of content, we're having to say children. Uh, but one thing that's kind of neat, you know, with that very, very simple code, we're able to, this is kind of a weird syntax right here, but what I'm telling it is, create a text box, assign it to the text box variable, and then output that. So, you know, you can, in PowerShell, if you were to do something like A equals 1 and wrap that in parentheses, it will, it will do the assignment and then also output what it is. So what this is saying, this is like saying, 
you know, create this text box, but we're also getting a handle to it so that we can, in here for the button, oh, and I need to fix that. I was supposed to go in and show you how, in the module, uh, right now the events don't have a prefix. There was a, a little variable at the beginning of the, the dynamic module where I could add a prefix. So, you know, right now we have button click somewhere. But anyway, so we're able to add an event handler in line in PowerShell like this. Again, it, the, the only way I've known how to do this if you do everything from PowerShell before is you create your XAML, you have to read that in, and then you have to kind of walk through it. You have to, you could assign it a name, but then you have to go search for that and get that and, and add, attach the event later. So with any luck, hopefully this won't crash, because that does happen occasionally. You know, all, all this is doing, you know, set up so that you can say, put a message here, you can type show message, and you can see that, you know, it did truly, it was able to read that, and we could attach that event handler in line. Now, the, the biggest problems I kind of have with this right now are the fact that I had to do that. You know, in, normally when you're using XAML, you, you can just give it a name and then you can reference everything by that name later. So we're going to try to make it so we can do that. The other problem is I, I don't like how we have to know, uh, again, that I, you know, I would rather just be able to say window and then at some point have an open curly brace and a closed curly brace and have all that stuff in the middle. And WPF is really, it, it's, it's really kind of cool, you know, there are, uh, there's metadata associated with all these different elements. So you can come in and look at the window type and go to get custom attributes. Uh, we'll tell it that we want to look at the attributes that were inherited. So you can take a look. Oh, actually we're running all the time. So what we're going to do now we're going to make a couple improvements to that. All right. So the two big improvements are going to be we're going to make it so we can use the name parameter and it will automatically make a variable for us and we don't have to worry about it. And we're also going to make it to where you don't have to know about that content and that children. If you want, if you still want to use that syntax, that's fine. So I won't bore you too much with the details. I'll just show you that it, it definitely is possible. Our code, we had a little, you know, several more lines of code instead, and you now it's. Uh, it's uh, over 200, but now we can, I do want to show one thing here. Let's copy this instead of running it directly. Let's do this and before. So text box is still, yeah, so text box is there because we did that earlier. All right, let's run that again. And so now if you look here, so we called textbox and we didn't have to do that weird assignment thing. We were able to just say the name is going to be textbox. And if you come and look, textbox is not in the global scope. We don't want it in the global scope. That's going to you know, get real noisy and real messy. If you look, what I was able to do there is to add a dynamic, like a dynamic module that's attached to that window object. And if we try to run this, You see that the text box lives inside that scope, so you know it doesn't. It shouldn't affect anybody, and it should still show dialog. This should still work, and it does. So you know now you can have events that are completely in line. You know you, you define text box there, and then you can use it down here. Also, if you looked, we didn't have to do the content. It was aware of. It knows that a Windows default. Content property is called content, and it lets you do that. Uh, the other, the, the the next problem with this is if I tried to add like something with a grid. So in XAML, you have to have uh, there's a concept of something called an attached property, uh, a stack panel, or so like if you have a button inside of a grid, that button doesn't have a concept of the row or column it belongs to in a grid, or in a doc panel, which one of those it belongs to. So. Uh, you use what's called an attached property. So right now I can't really specify one of those. If I were to you know, come in and try to type button grid.row, which is kind of what the XAML stuff would look like, it's not going to let me do that. You know, I can't create a dynamic parameter to do that. It turns out though, with a little bit of trickery with that, you can end up, you know, if you if you create a parameter like a catch-all parameter that will allow all that stuff to come through, and we're just going to skip to the very, very end and run this. 
So you can end up with something that looks like this. This will work. The big thing I want to demo is so this is you know attached properties, right? So grid dot column property, column span property, right? So, so you know we're we're able to with a couple of extra lines of code. Now we can start doing attached properties. Uh, you have this is an, what's called an attached event. So we have uh, a combo box, and a combo box itself doesn't have a text changed event, but it does have a, uh, you know, it, it, it comes from uh, somewhere along the line, I think it inherits from a text box base, which does have a text box event or a text change event. So anyway, just to show that this kind of works, we can run that and hopefully it won't crash, don't crash, there we go. So, and this was, I didn't really describe what it was gonna do, but uh, it's, you know, it's a silly thing just to show that it did assign the right, everything to the right columns. And again, we had inline events that we were able to attach. So we can come in and grab something from here and it should change what's in that right band over there. Yep. Because, so. Anyway, so that's it. Um, <laughs> any questions? Uh, I will put it up right after this. It's going to be on GitHub. Uh, Ron, as a matter of fact, hold on. Get this captured. So, uh, github.com slash Ron Edwards. And if you need to contact me, uh, Twitter at Magic Ron. Have you tried playing with any of the AST stuff yet? Uh, Easy to generate some of that stuff. I did, actually.